Meta continues to trade under $100 per share. And there are some people who are thinking that this is a generational wealth creating opportunity. And others are thinking that uh, it might be a little bit too risky right now. And so in this video, I'm going to completely go through and dissect the whole earnings release. And then I'm going to provide you with a modeling walkthrough on how we get to both of those valuation spectrums. And so while you guys smash that like button, let me run that intro. What's up guys and welcome back to the video and this has been an absolutely crazy time for Meta and so what I actually did was I spent hours I think around eight or nine hours on just understanding dissecting that meta release a lot of you guys have been messaging me you guys have been putting it on the comments that you want a real thorough breakdown and so that's what i'm going to provide to you in this video and so this is how i'm going to go through it so the question really is 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 meta on life support and so the first section that i'm going to cover in this video is i'm going to walk through the most important points from this earnings release and then after that I'm going to break out the financial statements using the provided guidance. So essentially give you a forecast of how I see the financial statements looking into the next 10 years. And then I'm going to provide the lower case and a base case valuation. And you guys know if you watched video one of this three part series that the lower case gets you to a valuation of around 80 bucks a share. The base case will get you to around $150 per share. And so I'll show you how that happens. And then once this video is out, I'm going to take a break and I'm going to go and bake an apple pie with the wife. And so you guys can ask me how the apple pie came out later. And so you can see this is what I mean about Meta trading under $100 per share. It closed as of yesterday, so Friday, at $99.20. So the question that a lot of you guys will be asking in this environment is what do sort of like the valuation heavy like modeling heavy type youtubers like myself who like i'll go through every single line of the financial statements and model everything out what do we sort of think how are we landing on the spectrum and you know the short answer is that it's not an easy answer i'm landing on the fact that i think this company's worth around 150 dollars per share but i'm going to also show you why it could be worth 80 dollars per share and so this was the big takeaway that people were saying is that Meta's costs and expenses did rise year over year and operating income did decline as well. And so people are really scared about the rising costs with Meta as they continue to invest in Reality Labs, which is, of course, their foray into the metaverse. But the one thing that I do want to point out to you guys is there's this chart that they provide in their presentation. So this is number 10 of their presentation. They're daily active people using their family of apps actually grew 4% year over year. So now you have almost 3 billion users. And so the growth is not the important item here. The more important item is that the apps remain important and people continue to use them. Remember, you can have revenue growth far surpassing the amount of user growth because Meta continues to find more and more revenue opportunities for their family of apps. And that's exactly how you should be thinking about your investment in Meta. And they break out their legacy app, which is of course Facebook. And it's interesting that that also continues to grow internationally. Now, if you have looked at any one of my models, I know you guys, the Patreons at that $5 level have access to all the models. You know that that's been my expectation. And so just slower growth overall and, you know, growth coming from sort of that rest of the world that asia pacific segment is what i've been expecting and i've expected stagnated growth from europe and the us and canada but the one thing that you guys also have to be aware of is that there has been a slight slowdown in the ad spending market now i'm going to break that out for you guys and this is something that we were expecting anyways because we're entering into like a fed constrained environment with higher rates and so we need to be aware that with further fed actions this actually could move further in this direction. So in Q3, average revenue per person declined 8%. So just be aware of that. That is a risk on the horizon, not just with Meta, you know, just with advertising technology companies as a whole. And you can see they provided a little bit more detail on sort of what's happening. And so their healthcare and travel verticals were the largest positive contributors to growth. And so that's really good. I think there's still a lot of pent up demand for travel. So that makes a lot of sense. But notice that they're saying that they're seeing softness in other verticals, including online commerce, gaming, financial services, and CPG. And so the one that sort of scares me a little bit is the decline with online commerce because a lot of online commerce advertising is directed at 
Facebook. So be very careful of the potential recession that we might be in continuing to get worse. Now they break it down even further here. They're saying that in the third quarter, the total number of ad impressions served across your services increased 17% while the average price per ad decreased 18%. So they're kind of holding the line here by increasing impressions. Now you can't indefinitely do that before you make the experience on the app worse. And so you're gonna have to just take into account the fact that the average price per ad could decrease further and it the number of impressions doesn't keep up. And so there is a headwind on the horizon that could happen for us in the ad business. And so as investors in Meta, we sort of have to expect that or at least forecast that a little bit or consider it as part of the risks in our investment in this company. Now they're noticing that just overall with their business, they still believe that they're behind where they think they should be, but they do believe that they're gonna get to healthier revenue trends next year. And so when it comes to sort of their budgets, they are being a little bit more conservative, both with their revenue expectations and you know their bottom line expense forecasts. And that's kind of my read through here. They expect, to end 2023 with either the roughly the same size or even a slightly smaller organization than they are today. But guys, no, that doesn't mean that 2023's expenses are gonna be lower than 2022. And I'll explain that further as we go along in these slides. So they expect fourth quarter revenue to be in the range of 30 to 32 and a half billion dollars. Now, one of the reasons why that's a little bit lower than what analysts were expecting is because they're getting impacted by a stronger US dollar. Obviously, if you have a stronger US dollar, the translation impact of foreign denominated revenues translate to a lower amount of US dollars. They effectively buy fewer US dollars and so that translates on the financial statements. However, you guys have to keep in mind that just because it's being captured on the financial statements as a lower translated amount doesn't necessarily mean that they're moving those funds into US dollars. They might just be keeping those funds in the international currency. And so as sort of like these currencies level out over the next five or so years, you will s capture sort of like translation adjustments as well. So, you know, revenue could just be temporarily impacted by this but you could get this later on so just take that into consideration as you sort of think of revenue headwinds as a result of currency translation issues now the one thing that i want to note to you and i said this on the previous slide here is that note the large increase that we have to model to expenses so they're going from around 85 to 87 billion dollars in total expenses in 2022 to 96 to 101 billion in 2023 and so this is what i mean about Expenses are increasing despite Mark Zuckerberg saying that the company's number of employees will remain flat. What you're seeing here is the full year impact of those hired midway through fiscal year 2022. So keep that in mind as we go into the modeling of the remainder of 2022 and modeling out 2023 and beyond using the guidance that they're providing here. And when you look beyond 2023, notice that they're telling us how to model expenses beyond 2023. They're saying that the rate of percentage growth is expected to decelerate meaningfully as they curtail non-headcount related expense growth items and they expect to keep 2023 headcount roughly flat with sort of like the current levels that they're at but what they're not saying is that it's not gonna grow so just take that into consideration as we start forecasting out 2024 and beyond. And I'll show you how I'm doing that. The other thing that you gotta be aware of, and a lot of people are missing this, I haven't seen any YouTubers talk about this, is that as they release their consumer product for Reality Labs next year, they expect cogs to go up. And so we have to be modeling in higher cogs in 2024. So what they're saying is the growth in cost of revenue is expected to accelerate, driven by infrastructure related expenses and to a lesser extent, Reality Lab hardware costs driven by the launch of their next gen consumer quest headset later in the year. So the other part that I just missed out, and I think it's a more material part, is that they're building out sort of infrastructure related to sort of like their AI and infrastructure related to sort of like other initiatives as they sort of grow out revenues into the future. Now, the, once again, they do expect Reality Labs operating losses in 2023 and they expect them to, to grow significantly year over year. We just sort of forecast that with total expenditures. And of course that gets offset by profitability in their ad spending business. And so overall, you'll just see that with lower net income as a percentage of revenue 
And that's really saying that the business is becoming less profitable as time goes on, as they invest into these other initiatives. And just looking at CapEx, notice that they expect 2022 CapEx to be around 32 to 33 billion. And in 2023, they expect CapEx to increase to around 34 to 39 billion. And so what you might want to consider here is that that incremental CapEx growth might not necessarily be a cash burn because it looks like it's going into the AI business as they're saying that in the increase in AI capacity is driving substantially all of their capital expenditure growth in 2023. And this sort of helps explain that last comment a little bit more. So they're saying here that we're going through an investment cycle, which is being driven primarily by two large areas in investment. The first one is significantly expanding their AI capacity, which are the investments that are driving substantially all of their capital expenditure growth in 2023. And essentially what they're saying is that they expect those investments to provide a technology advantage and unlock meaningful improvements across many of their key initiatives, which include the feed, reels and ads. Now in the next slide, I'll explain to you in more detail what exactly they're doing, but I just want to point out that they said that they're carefully evaluating the return that they generate on those capital investments, which is very important because you don't just want them to invest blindly. I know a lot of people are upset that they almost feel as though reality labs is like a blind investment. So you don't want them to just invest blindly in other uh, capital initiatives as well. And so the point here, and I have to pause you guys, is that now that you have a bit of a confirmation that these investments are not in reality labs, they're in their ad spending business, you have to make a decision and consider if these investments will contribute to higher revenues in the future. Based on their track record of success with this, I do, but you know, it's up to you guys to determine what you believe. And now here are the three primary areas of focus, which is where those capital expenditures are going or those incremental capital expenditures. I mean, so the first area is their AI discovery engine that's powering reels and reels is becoming more and more successful. So that's a good thing and a great place to be investing in, I believe. The second one is in their ads and business messaging platforms. And so they're already starting to see success with their business messaging platforms. And they talked about that in other areas of their Q3 transcript. And so I'll let you guys go and find that yourselves. And then, of course, the third area that they're investing in is their future vision of the metaverse. So I believe that one and two seem to be increasing engagements. I believe that Reels is starting to win. And I think the metaverse is a bit of a question mark. And so the read through to me, when they say that their current surge in CapEx is largely due to building out their AI infrastructure is that for me, over the medium term, we have to expect elevated CapEx and elevated R&D spend. So part of it you're gonna see on the income statement and part of it you're gonna see on the cash flow statement. And I'm gonna show you both. And once again, they're saying here that they expect Reality Lab ex expenses to increase meaningfully in 2023 with the launch of their next generation consumer quest headset. And like I said before, I'm gonna show you on the PL how that's increasing the costs of operating Meta as a whole, and it just decreases the profitability of the overall business. But essentially, the point that I'm making to you guys right now is that a lot of YouTubers right now are shying away from valuing Meta because of these sort of like unknowns, but I'm gonna show you how you can actually value it, and you can use like a base case and a low case and a high case, but you can do it, and you can walk through each line and just sort of explain to yourself how it works. And so we'll get into that very shortly. And you can see here that they are seeing success with their investments into that AI discovery engine. Reels is quickly growing across their apps and the usage is now up 50% from just six months ago. Now, the other thing that a lot of people aren't talking about is I personally can't see why TikTok doesn't get banned until at least Facebook and Twitter are opened up in China. I think that that could be a huge catalyst for the stock and something we need to be aware of. Although Gen Z is not on Facebook, they are on Instagram and WhatsApp. And like, just from sort of like a reciprocity perspective, why is the US allowing TikTok to operate in North America while China is not allowing Facebook and Twitter to operate in China? Now, I don't actually think China's gonna make Facebook available for the Chinese citizens. They have a huge lock on how social media operates there, but 
why should the US allow TikTok to flourish in North America? So that's where I see the potential for a strong catalyst for Facebook's shares as TikTok essentially goes away. The question is, will it happen? I don't know if it happens, but just from like a fairness perspective, I almost think that it should, but I'm not advocating for that, of course. Now, one thing that a lot of people are very knowledgeable in this space will say is that Reels does not monetize at the same rate that other sort of like Facebook apps monetize that and they're right. And so what's really happening here is that Meta is choosing to take more than a $500 million quarterly revenue headwind as they shift the business into reels. But they have given us a timeline for when they expect the revenue headwind to subside. And they're saying that they're going to get to a more neutral place over the next 10 to sort of like 12 to 18 months. And so that's really good. We sort of have a timeline now. It's a lot faster than what I thought. I thought Reels would take around two, three, four, five years to monetize at the same level. It looks like they're getting there a lot faster than what I thought they'd get at. And the other part here is they finally figured out a way to monetize WhatsApp. And that's sort of like that business messaging platform that they discussed earlier. So they're saying here, we started with click to messaging ads, which lets businesses run ads on Facebook and Instagram that start a thread on Messenger, WhatsApp, or Instagram direct so they can communicate with customers directly. So WhatsApp just passed a $1.5 billion run rate and it's growing at more than 80% year over year. So in other words, you know, a couple of years ago, a lot of people are concerned with how are they going to monetize Messenger and how are they going to monetize WhatsApp? Well, now you have the answer. And paid messaging is just another opportunity that they look to be starting into. And so there seems to be a lot of runway here. And so it allows businesses on their platforms to use WhatsApp as the main messaging service to answer customer requests and updates and sell directly in the chat. So between click to messaging and paid messaging, Mark Zuckerberg is actually just confident that this is going to be a big opportunity. So when it comes to forecasting out revenues, this is why you're going to see that my base case might actually on the surface level seem a little bit too optimistic, but this is why I'm slightly more optimistic than more people who are valuing meta in this space. And just talking about the elephant in the room, this is how they're talking about the metaverse. There are 200 million people who get new PCs every year, which are mostly for work. And Meta's goal for the Quest Pro line over the next several years is to enable more and more of these people to get their work done in virtual or mixed reality environments. And they could eventually do the work even better than they could do on PCs. And they're starting partnerships, as we can see. We already saw the announcement of the Microsoft partnership. They also have an Adobe partnership. They have a Zoom partnership and they have an Accenture partnership. And so what they're saying is between the AI discovery engine, their ads, business messaging platforms, and their future vision for the metaverse, they're really optimistic on the business. And I personally really think that this could be big, but I wonder how big the sort of metaverse opportunity will be in sort of like the medium term timeline, because I think guys like myself will be very interested in it but I think adoption will take a long time. Some of you could argue that we're in sort of like the early to mid nineties where everybody adopts at the same time. I'm thinking that we're probably in a slower adoption period. And so, I don't know, does it take 10, 15, 20 years for full adoption? I don't know what the answer is. I really have to see what the offerings are and what the apps provide us. Listen, if you can get things done faster, better, easier <laughs> using these metaverse platforms, then of course the adoption will be much faster than what I'm even predicting. And so you sort of have this optionality with meta. And so that's what I really like about this investment as sort of like a shareholder. But you know, some of you guys could say, listen, Listen to like what Peter Lynch would say in this environment that it doesn't, you don't necessarily have to be on the ground up. You can invest after you've sort of seen it take off and sort of prove itself and still make a handsome amount of money. And so no matter what you decide in this environment, whether you decide that it's too much of a risk right now, or you're saying, listen, I really believe in this and I want to get in now. I don't think either one of you are wrong. And let's dive right into my forecast. So this is how I'm forecasting revenue. Now, remember guys, this model is available to all Patreons at that $5 level. On the left, you have sort of their actual results. So 2017 through 2021. On the right, you have sort of my forecast. And so 
I'm forecasting negative revenue growth in 2022, as you can see here. I'm forecasting 5% revenue growth in 2023. That might actually be negative if, you know, the Fed continues to raise rates. We'll see how it plays out. 5% is sort of a base case. We'll see what happens. And then 2025 and thereafter, I'm forecasting 7.5% revenue growth annually. And this is sort of like my, once again, is my lower case scenario. And so this revenue growth is what got me to that $80 per share price or valuation for Meta, which you saw in video one of this three-part series. And here's my base case to slightly more optimistic case scenario. Now, the reason why I'm forecasting 12.5% annual revenue growth is because I see a lot of value from that AI platform increasing impressions and that business messaging growth that they're experiencing. And so I see revenue growth ticking upwards also, I see rates returning, like rate growth returning. And so you're going to get some of these tailwinds that'll grow revenues out. The one thing that I'm not forecasting here is huge revenues from the metaverse. And so I think meta could get around 12 percent annualized revenue growth just from their ad tech business alone and just recall guys in 2017 it grew at 47 percent 2018 it grew at 37 percent 2019 27 percent 2020 21 percent and then 2021 of course 37 percent but it's like on average this thing has been growing at an extremely fast rate do i think it'll return back to those growth rate levels no but do i think it can get to around 12 and a half percent absolutely but the top line revenue growth is not the story here it's how do you think about the expenses as you get to the bottom line and so notice that there's three major items as we forecast out expenses and once again you can see all of these if you have access to the model which is provided to all the patreons at that five dollar level the link to the patreon is in the description but notice here that there are and d expenditures i'm increasing to 30 percent as a percentage of revenue and the reason why i'm doing that is because they have told us that they expect higher investments into reality labs now if you scroll down a little bit notice that that gna for 2022 I'm increasing that to close to 14%. You're seeing it at 13.8% there. And the reason why I'm doing that is because they told us that their total costs for 2022 is around that 86, $87 billion range. So I increased that GNA to get total expenses to be in line with guidance. Now, moving into 2024, notice that my COGS as a percentage of revenue actually ticked up by two points. The reason why my COGS as a percentage of revenue increased by that amount is because I'm modeling the impact of that COGS increasing comment that they made as they roll out their consumer product device for Meta and sort of like their other growth initiatives. So recall that they did provide that comment. A lot of YouTubers and people who are valuing this out are missing that point, but it's really important because it pushes up that total cost and expenses as a percentage of revenue to 81.2% or approximately 81%. As time goes on, notice that these costs as a percentage of revenue decline because now you start seeing the revenue growth come as a result of these investments into the business and so you see that's why i've highlighted those comments on the far right and of course you'll see those comments in the model when you get access to to the model but overall the cost as a percentage of revenue is 60 percent in 2021 i expect it to go up as high as 81 percent in 2024 and then i expect it to decline to around 70 percent in 2031 and so essentially what i'm saying is it's not just important to forecast out revenues you need to be able to forecast out expenses in an intelligent manner in line with the guidance that they're providing in their Q3 transcript, which you guys can all download and look through yourselves. I've highlighted key points in those transcripts, which I think are the most important for you to understand. But of course, I highly encourage you to not just reading the transcript, but I also encourage you to go through the Q&A as well, because the analyst asked some very good questions. These are people that are much smarter than myself, and they're really getting to the nuts and bolts of the main issues that Meta is addressing right now. And so, you know, it's interesting to see them asking those questions and getting the management's response for it. Now, I showed you the PL, and now I want to walk you through the cash flow statement, and which is how I'm valuing Meta. Now, before I go into sort of the nitty gritty of it, the one thing I want to point out is that somebody recently mentioned to me that like I'm on the inside team when it comes to like 
talking about financial statements. So I have to like slow down sometimes and just explain the basics here. So just note guys that the way that the cash flow statement is related to the income statement is that the cash flow statement starts with net income, which is the last line on the income statement. And then you start with net income and you add back all like the non-cash items to get to cash flow operations. From there, you subtract out the CapEx costs to get to free cash flow. And so that's what I'm doing here. So you can see that I'm forecasting out net income, which is what we walked through in the PL analysis. Then here I'm adding back some non-cash charges, which would be the depreciation and amortization. I'm just using sort of like a straight line amount. And then the stock-based compensation, which I forecast, uh, that's a non-cash item. So that gets you to cash from operations. And then you subtract from that the PPE. Recall, guys, that that $39 billion that you see in 2023 and beyond, they're not telling us that CapEx is reducing. They're just saying in their guidance that CapEx as a percentage of revenue is going to decline. So that leads me to forecast out CapEx expenditures at effectively $40 billion thereafter, $39 billion thereafter. In fact, I should probably be ticking it up a little bit, but I'll just leave it at that for now. But that gets me to my free cash flow number, which is what you're seeing below. But notice that I don't forecast using free cash flow that a lot of YouTubers do. I forecast using net free cash flow. And the reason why I forecast using net free cash flow is because I've burdened free cash flow with a deduction or a charge for stock-based compensation because it's ultimately a charge against equity holders because it dilutes our equity. So you notice that in this whole cash flow reconciliation, I add back stock-based compensation when it when I get to cash from operations. But then once again, I deduct that same amount when it comes to getting to net free cash flow. So it's an in and an out. And that's how I encourage you guys to sort of think about free cash flow when you forecast out using the cash flow statement. And so that's what I'm using here. And now let's get into the valuation. So you can see that my free cash flow per share valuation using the lower case scenario gets us to that valuation of $80 per share, which is what you saw in the previous video. So that's how we're getting to that number. But if you're forecasting revenues to grow and instead of 7.5% a year, you're using 12.5% a year, this company's worth $150 per share and so the share price as a percentage of its valuation is 67 percent so if you can get it for you know 75 bucks a share or lower it's a huge value and so in other words what i'm saying is things have changed we got more information we're able to better model this company out and like i said 12.5 percent revenue growth might actually be on the low end as well if you really believe in the metaverse which i do but i'm just not forecasting it in so if you believe in their new investments into their ai into their messaging platform and also into the growth of the metaverse, then you should probably be forecasting revenue growth at around 15% or higher. But I'm just not doing that. But if you did, you'd get to the valuation of around 200 or higher. But $150 per share valuation is very good. Now, if you missed that previous video, you can get to that video right here. And if you wanna see sort of like how I'm investing in meta, when that video becomes available, that'll be part three of the series. That video will be available right here.